Hey everyone, good to see you again. A few people have noticed that I've been on a bit of a hiatus with my channel and I never really intended for this to happen. I think my last video came out around the end of August. I was just getting hyped for the Women in Translation readathon and then September happened and school started back again and it got really busy and really chaotic and it's still busy and chaotic but I've been reading so many wonderful things and I haven't been talking about them on this channel and I've really missed doing that so I'm trying to get my act together and start filming again. The problem with booktube is that the longer you step away the more that you read and the more you have to talk about so that makes filming a wrap-up video feel really intimidating and in today's video I think I have about 30 books that I want to talk about so these are the books that I've been reading from the end of August through October. November actually ended up being a very decent reading month for me so that will have to be its own whole wrap-up video but we'll cross that bridge when we're there. So I'm gonna have to move through these books pretty quickly to keep this video at a decent length so I'm sorry if I can't go more in depth about all of this stuff. This is more just kind of me getting back in the swing of things and updating you about what's been going on and what I've been reading this fall. So I hope you enjoy this chaotic wrap-up. So I've got a few different stacks of books to talk about in this video. I've got uh, the books that I read for the Women in Translation readathon in August. I've got some stuff from Victober. I've got a few books I had to read for school, some books that I read for my 20th century project, uh, some other random books that don't really fit into a category, and finally I've got a few books that have to deal with Shakespeare. And I will save that for the very end in case that's not a subject that you're interested in. So let's start off with the Women in Translation readathon. This happened in the last week of August. That already feels like it was a lifetime ago. I think I read about nine books for this readathon. My strategy was to kind of go with shorter books that I could get through quicker and that helped me be pretty successful with this readathon. I think what I'm going to do is go through them from least favorite to favorite. So starting off at the bottom we have August by Romina Paula and she is an Argentinian author and the coolest thing about this book is that it's set in Patagonia which is a part of the world that I've never read about but I thought it would be so perfect to read a book called August in the month of August but it ended up being funny because August in Patagonia is actually in the winter so this book was not the summery beach vibe that I was hoping it to be it was kind of more of a chilly winter book and this is one that it was pretty good but it ended up kind of disappointing me it's about a girl who goes back to her hometown to mourn her best friend who has died and they're gonna scatter her ashes and I thought this book was gonna be about loss and the grief that she went through but it kind of was mostly about her reconnecting with her ex-boyfriend who was kind of a jerk so I didn't really love the direction that this took but I'm still glad that I checked it out because it was cool to read about Patagonia. And then on my list we have The Lover by Marguerite Dura and this was translated from the French and this is a novel that is apparently heavily autobiographical and it's about a girl who grew up in Vietnam at the time it was a French colony in Indochina and she has this love affair with this Chinese man and she's pretty young while this is all going down and it's kind of her as an older person remembering this time and this pivotal relationship and this was really well crafted and I feel like it's the kind of novella that you would really appreciate having read a couple of times because uh, I think it would be very interesting to explore how her perspective shifts in the book. However, I did find the love story in this book pretty uncomfortable to read about because of the age gap and some of that dynamic so it's not really a story that I fell in love with but I think that it was very artfully constructed so I could still appreciate it on that level. And then I have another French novel. This is The Party Wall by Catherine LaRue. She's an author from Quebec and this is a book that I was loving so much in the beginning. It was kind of told in these interconnected short stories where you'd be introduced to a pair of people and they think that their relationship is one type of way and then there'd be this big plot twist where it turns out that they didn't actually know how they were connected. So those plot twists were really stunning. However, the second half of this novel wasn't as satisfying because you return back to these couples after these major plot shifts and they have to kind of resolve their relationship and it just wasn't as fun or shocking as the earlier stories so this one just felt kind of disappointing in the end and I didn't love the way that the author tried to sloppily connect all of the characters together so it was a bit of a miss but I'm very excited that I checked out this author because I think she's got some cool ideas. Then moving on to Brazil I have two novels by Fernanda Torres. I ended up liking this one a little bit more Glory and its Litany of Horrors. This is about an aging actor and his career basically as he's gone through the entertainment industry in Brazil trying to make it as a young struggling artist and then 
basically degrading himself as he continues on throughout his career until he has this totally humiliating performance of King Lear as an older actor. So I really liked seeing the ins and outs of the acting industry in Brazil. The author herself works in acting, so she seemed to have a very clear insider perspective. So this one was kind of cool for that. The end was a less satisfying read for me. This is about a group of five men who are friends, and it examines each of these men at the moment of their death and how they all respond to the loss of their friends and they are nostalgic and like thinking about the times that they had and this is kind of like a party boy novel. Most of these guys weren't great for the most part so it's kind of like about their antics and all of the women that they've hurt and betrayed along the way. They're kind of selfish so this one wasn't as much fun as I was hoping it was going to be so I didn't love this one but still glad that I tried both of these books by this Brazilian author. Moving on I have Other Rushes by Victoria Lamasco. So this book was really cool stylistically. I've never read anything quite like it in that it's these graphic dispatches from Russia. So the author kind of goes around and she meets people and she draws them and she tells their stories. So I really liked the format for this book. I much preferred the first half where she goes to these kind of unusual locations in Russia. She went to a brothel and to a youth prison and she's telling some of these really shocking and compelling stories that you would never have heard about otherwise. The second half of the book had to do with more civil unrest in Russia and while that was still an important subject I think that that was material that readers in the Western world would maybe be more familiar about. It covers things like Pussy Riot and protests that are happening against Putin so it was still cool to read about it but I really uh, much preferred the things that she was doing with the first half of this. I've got another Russian text coming in next and that is City Folk and Country Folk by Sofia Kvashkinskaya. I really enjoy reading 19th century Russian classics and sadly this is the first ever one that I've read that was written by a female author so it was so cool to find this book and to read it it was totally delightful like this is a book that I read in about two sittings it was just really enjoyable it's about a mother and her daughter who live on this estate in Russia and this takes place after the serfs had been freed so it's kind of this time of political upheaval and all these changes and they just have these crazy neighbors so even though it's dealing with these heavy political themes it was just a really delightful, enjoyable, fast-paced read. One of those classics that still reads very fresh. So super happy to have discovered this one. And I'm going to try to look for some more works by Sophia's sister as well. Moving into my top three from the readathon, I have Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead by Olga Tokarczuk. And this is kind of being described as a literary murder mystery. It's about the small village in Poland where people are dying in these grisly and mysterious ways. And there's this eccentric old lady who lives in this village who thinks that animals are involved in these deaths in this strange kind of way. So what was great about this book was not even following the plot and finding out what happens in this mystery. It's really just spending time with this eccentric narrator. I just loved her voice. She's this fierce animal rights advocate and she's got a passion for the poetry of William Blake and she's just so entertaining and engaging that this book really warmed my heart just because of the strange narrative perspective. So I really liked checking this one out. I'm gonna have to read a lot more by this author because I was really into it. Next up I have a novella by a Quebecois author and that is Mad Shadows by Marie-Claire Blais. And this is a strange book to talk about because I read it in one sitting in the middle of the night. So part of me feels like I dreamed this book and that it doesn't actually exist because it's kind of hazy in my mind the whole experience of reading this. But this was very intense for a novella. Like I kind of had to read it in one sitting because I couldn't put it down but I also needed it to be over because it is so dark and violent and twisted. It's about this extremely dysfunctional French family. There's one daughter who's considered to be ugly and she's quite unloved in the family and then there's a beautiful son who has kind of been coddled so much in his life that he's sort of mentally undeveloped and it's kind of this bitter relationship that these siblings have between each other and their mother and it's just so twisted. It gets so violent. It gets so messy, so dramatic. So it's short but a lot of drama goes down in this one. So I really liked checking this out even though it was super messed up. And then finally my favorite thing that I read for this readathon oh, was this giant collected comics from the Moomin series by Tove Janssen who is a Swedish speaking Finnish author. And I read this throughout the entire month of August but I finished it during the Women in Translation readathon and this was just 
the most delightful thing about my summer. Like I would just wake up in the morning and the sunlight would be streaming in and I would make a pot of tea and I would read a Moomin comic and all would be right in the world. This is about the delightful adventures of the Moomin family and they're a family of creatives. They're kind of artistic. They go on these adventures. They take a lot of naps. They eat. They live a really good life and they get into all of these silly ridiculous situations and I just loved every character in this. Toby Johnson is so clever. You know these are comics that could be appealing to children or really anyone who's young at heart so super glad to have checked this one out. This was just the highlight of my summer. <laughs> Moving forward now to another readathon. I tried to participate in Victober even though October was not a stellar reading month for me. I was still able to hit up most of the challenges in reading only three books. So my favorite read for Victober was actually a reread and that was one of the challenges was to reread a Victorian classic and I checked out The Return of the Native by Thomas Hardy. I think I read this one originally maybe four or five years back. I read it in the summertime and I quite liked it but it wasn't one of my favorite Hardys and I have to say that I really appreciate this one a lot more having gone through it a second time. There are some truly memorable scenes in this book especially the ones set on Egdon Heath. The scene in the beginning where they're burning the bonfires and Eustacia Vi who's this total femme fatale. She's kind of walking around on the moors looking for her lover. So that scene is just so good. And then there were a few characters that really jumped out at me this time around. Christian Cantle is this peasant guy who is like afraid of everything and everyone calls his gender and his manhood into question because he's such a scaredy cat. But I really liked his character. He made me laugh every scene that he showed up. I also totally fell in love with one of the secondary characters in this, Diggory Venn. He is a rental man, which is a job that doesn't exist anymore, but basically he would go dyeing sheep and he would be covered head to toe in red dye. So you picture this kind of semi-demonic character wandering around red from head to toe in the moors and he got rejected by this girl, but he hangs around and he tries to prevent too much trouble from happening to her because he knows that her husband's a bad dude. So he kind of follows this husband around and gets in his way and causes some trouble. And I really liked his chaotic neutral vibes and how he wouldn't mind breaking a few rules, but ultimately he was kind of good at heart. So that character was really cool. So, so happy to revisit this one. Then I also read Agnes Grey by Anne Bronte and this met the challenge of being a Victorian classic written by a female author and a book that was published in the same year as my favorite Victorian classic. It's kind of wild to think that Wuthering Heights and Jane Eyre and Agnes Grey were all dropped on the world in the same year. And while this one isn't quite as iconic as the other two pivotal works by her sisters, this is still a very solid book that details the life of a governess. And it's an interesting interesting career to read about since we don't really have governesses in the same way in society and women have so many more options for careers now but really at the time if you were an educated lady that needed to make some money this was one of the only careers available to you and it was a pretty lousy job for the most part since there were no protections around for governesses. You were kind of just left at the mercy of the family that you were working for and you had to pull these crazy long hours and you had to basically be in charge of someone else's children while being told what to do by the parents and it sounds very stressful. They did not get great compensation so I really enjoyed learning more about this profession so it's kind of a short and simple tale but pretty fascinating to learn more about the time period. And last up for Victober I read Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. This met the prompt of being a Victorian classic over 500 pages although this is hardly that lengthy by Victorian standards but whatever. You know, this is a book that actually did drag quite a lot. It did take me most of the month to read because I guess it just didn't need to be this long. I feel like I was kind of familiar with the story from having seen the musical ages ago. And all of the really great stuff in this book, I think, is, is in the first 100 pages and the hardships that Oliver is going through in the workhouse and some of the awful guardians that he has. I really liked those moments. And while I really liked reading about this seedy underbelly side of London and reading about Fagin and like the gang of criminals, unfortunately, I felt like the characterization was a little too simplistic with this one where characters were either like really wonderful, morally pure people or they were kind of these seedy criminals or 
criminal with a heart of gold. I just didn't feel like the plot was that engaging or the characters were really all that wonderful. So can't say that I loved this one, but glad that I gave it a go. Next up, I have three Canadian novels that I had to read for the grade 12 English course that I'm teaching now. I didn't hate any of these, but I also didn't really love any of them. So I'm not going to spend too much time on them. But I ended up reading No Great Mischief by Alistair MacLeod. This is a book that's set in Cape Breton in Atlantic Canada. And it's about a man who is very nostalgic and he is just remembering his whole life story and the story of his ancestors and his family. And it's a very slow and meandering kind of book. So if you're into those sort of long winded family tales, then you might like this one. But I thought that this book was way too repetitive. And it also became a little bit too much of a parody of itself that I ended up kind of laughing more than I felt like I should have at this book. But yeah, it was way too nostalgic for my taste. So did not love this one. Then I read The Book of Negroes by Lawrence Hill. This is a really fascinating work of historical fiction. It covers a very wide span of time through the life of a girl who's been kidnapped from her hometown in Africa and then shipped over to a slave plantation in the US. But she moves around to a lot of different places, including Canada and England, and then she goes back to Africa. So if you like historical fiction that covers a wide range of history and settings, you might like this one. Unfortunately, what kept me from really connecting with this book is that the main character is just perfect. She's one of those narrators that is really good at everything. Everyone gravitates themselves towards her and she makes friends with people quickly and she's beautiful and she's talented and she's very intelligent. She's a quick learner. People trust her. She just gets through adversity in a way that's impressive but also feels a little soulless because it just, you know, she's just so good at it and you don't really feel that kind of human struggle in her. So I had a hard time really getting invested in this novel because I just felt like the main character was a little bit too perfect for my taste, but still really impressive work of historical fiction. And then last up, I have Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. This is probably the one I liked the most out of these three. It's a post-apocalyptic tale, which isn't usually my thing, but it's about a group of people who form a traveling symphony and theater troupe performing the works of Shakespeare. So of course, that's kind of more up my alley reading about the arts. And this is a really beautifully constructed book that explores some characters who lived before society collapsed collapsed and some of the people who are living after the collapse and it really does make you appreciate life as we know it right now in the present day. Like I really value tap water and electricity. Unfortunately what kept me from loving this one is that I didn't feel that kind of emotional connection with the characters. They seemed kind of distant for the most part but I know a lot of people who really love this one. So on one hand, I can see that it is really beautiful and it's really well told, but it just didn't hit me on that level, like in the gut that I really wanted from this kind of post-apocalyptic book. I felt myself distanced from it. So glad I checked it out, but didn't quite love it. Next up, I have five books that count towards my 20th century reading challenge, where I'm trying to read one book published in each year of the 20th century. I'm slowly but surely making some progress in the 1910s. So I've got a few books from that decade to talk about. Uh, one of them being The Reef by Edith Warden. I really love Edith Warden. She has yet to disappoint me with any of her novels and this was no exception. This one's set at a French chateau and it's about a woman who's recently become a widow and she gets involved with this old flame of hers and he comes to visit her but what she doesn't know is that he had this fling with this young woman that is her governess and is also engaged to her stepson. So like there's this whole confusing web of relationships. It's basically Edith Warden taking on a love rectangle and you know that it's going to be messy and emotional. So this was a really fun psychological read. Then I also have Petersburg by Andre Belli. And this is a modernist Russian text. And it's so interesting reading about pre-revolution Russia where you can see these tensions that are really starting to boil and cause some chaos and this was a really challenging novel. It's this deep dive into the city of St. Petersburg but it's also kind of metaphysical and there's a lot of weird happenings that are going on. Essentially it's about this young guy who starts making friends with some revolutionaries and then they want him to assassinate his father who is a Russian official and they hand him over this time 
bomb and he basically has to go through all of this existential turmoil because though he doesn't really get along very well with his dad he doesn't exactly want to be responsible for assassinating him so you get some juicy dysfunctional family dynamics in here as well as a lot of political stuff and some strange surrealist weird magical fantastical happenings so this was just such a strange book but it was a truly incredible read so very glad that I tried this one out and then I read Howard's End by E.M. Forster this is a delightful read about England kind of around the time of the turn of the century and it explores three different families that are representing these three different social classes and it's kind of exploring the future of England and how all of these people people are going to kind of have to come together and connect and work together. This is a book that has a lot of juicy interpersonal drama that will keep you wanting to read because there is a lot of tension between these characters, but it's also just one of those warm and comforting British modern classics. It's just really charming and it's well written. I quite enjoyed reading this on its own for the first time, but I have to say I fell in love with it even more after watching the wonderful film adaptation with Emma Thompson and Anthony Hopkins and uh, Helena Bonham Carter so I think that in hindsight made me appreciate this book even more so this was just a delightful read totally loved it and one that I know I'll be rereading a bunch in the future moving beyond the 1910s I did also check out the talented mr. Ripley by Patricia Highsmith I think that was from 1955 and I quite enjoyed that one Tom Ripley is just a fascinating character study this kind of sociopathic guy who's trying to create his identity by clinging on to others and acting in this really chaotic way so I have to say that I loved the first 100 pages of that book I thought the narrative voice was so engaging and I loved that Tom Ripley like couldn't handle being around people and he felt like exploding and I, I just loved getting to know him. However, the second half of the book gets more into plot territory where he's trying to get out of some of the trouble that he gets into and I wasn't quite as compelled with that half because I have seen the film already and I know what happens so totally loved the beginning of this book but it did lose a bit of steam for me going into the second half and moving forward into the 1970s I read Salem's Lot by Stephen King this was a book I wanted to check out in October because I thought it would give me those creepy Halloween vibes since it's about a small town that gets kind of destroyed by these vampire like apparitions and I'll say that this is probably my favorite Stephen King novel that I've read so far I haven't had the best luck with Stephen King I don't think that I totally connect with his style as an author though I can really appreciate his imagination and I like how he tries to flesh out these small towns by describing a wide cast of characters and giving a lot of the historical details like you do really feel immersed in his world there were some creepy moments in this book but overall it just felt like it was a little bit too long like there was a little bit too much drag and that's kind of a complaint that I have with horror books sometimes because that whole suspenseful atmosphere can't be sustained throughout the whole thing I get it but when a horror book is over 500 pages it does get to be a bit much but I did really like the idea that he explores in this one about what would happen in our hyper rational logical scientific society when these weird paranormal supernatural events happen and would people people respond in time because we don't really believe in vampires anymore like would that work to our disadvantage so there's some cool ideas in this one and I'm glad that I checked it out all right now we're gonna move forward to my random pile of books that don't really have anything in common with each other the first one from the stack is Dom Casmuro by Machado de Assis and he's a Brazilian writer and this one almost made it into my 20th century reading challenge. This was published in 1899 though, so tail end of the 19th century. And this is a very well-known work of Brazilian literature and it's about a man looking back on his life and how he was in love with the girl next door and they wanted to be together, but his mother had promised him to become a priest so he kind of had to get out of his future career so he could be with this girl. And it's this kind of complicated love story and I really enjoyed reading this one back in September. It was quite engaging and it was told in this very creative way. But now it is two months later and I hardly remember anything about it. So I feel really bad about that because I remember it being good, but very little about the story has stuck with me. So I know that this is a Brazilian classic and I probably should give it another go because I sadly, uh, it didn't stick with me, but I did like it at the time. By far the worst book that I read throughout the months of August, September, and October was definitely this one called Falling is Like This by Kate Rockland. 
this is kind of a rom-com type book, which is not really my genre, not hating on it, just not really something I go for. But I was kind of in a reading slump in October, like it just wasn't going well. I was trying to read all these Victorian classics and I needed something light just to keep me reading. And this book kind of fit the bill, even though it was super awful. I picked it up, I used copy at my Value Village because the front cover was blurbed by Courtney Love, who called this saucy and sexy. And yeah, never read a book that's recommended on the front cover by Courtney Love, it was not a good decision. But basically it's about this ditzy girl who falls in love with this punk rock musician and they get into this like quick and passionate love affair. And you could tell that this is a book that's written about the punk music scene by someone who is not really a fan of the punk music scene. Like the punk characters just did not ring true. So that made me frustrated as someone who's really interested in rock music and all of its subcultures. Like just nothing about this felt very authentic. It was very cringy. There are so many pages that I just have dog-eared because there were lines that I just couldn't handle. So this one was not good. But at the same time I kind of enjoyed reading something and roasting it and just outright hating it. So I guess it served its own purpose in a way. But not good. The best book that I probably read out of this stack was Deep River by Carl Merlantes. And this is actually a 2019 release. And this is another one of those big tree books that seem to be happening these days. I'm thinking about Barkskins, I'm thinking about The Overstory. This is a book about a family of Finnish immigrants who leave Finland because of some political turmoil during the Russian occupation before Finnish independence. And they move to the forests of the Pacific Northwest and they try to rebuild their lives. And one of the girls is a pretty solid socialist and she goes stirring up trouble and trying to create unions and protect the rights of these loggers. So it was fascinating watching her journey and how that affected her own personal life and her relationships. Very painful to read about social activists who have to make these really tough commitments. So this was a book that I just really loved. Like I really enjoyed reading this and I think part of that is because my family is Finnish so I just felt so much Finnish culture pouring off the page of this and just reading about these stoic and strong Finnish people. I just loved it. If you're at all interested in big tree books, please do give this one a try. Another book that I read in September that I thoroughly enjoyed was This Place, 150 Years Retold. And this is a graphic short story collection. And it's so cool in that it covers a wide span of Canadian history. It's exploring the colonial relationship between the Canadian government and settlers and indigenous people. And it covers a wide range of locations as well. Each of the stories in this collection is told by a different author and is illustrated by a different artist. So I really liked how much variety there was in this collection. Like there are so many different beautiful art styles and you were introduced to so many different First Nations, Métis and Inuit perspectives and you learned all of these great stories, many of which were based in some kind of historical moment or truth. So this was just a wonderful collection. I really wish that I had read this when I was a teenager. There's just so much wonderful stylistic diversity in this collection you really do learn a lot but in an engaging kind of way so would highly recommend this for anyone who's looking to get some graphic short stories from an indigenous perspective next up I have two random nonfiction books here for you one of them is called refuse Kenlet in ruins and this book is very niche you probably won't be interested in this unless you are interested in following the Canadian literary scene but basically if you're not from Canada and you don't know there are a lot of fractures in the Canadian literary scene at the moment there's a lot of Attention. There are all of these um, divisive politics that are kind of keeping the scene apart and a lot of people are not feeling included or appreciated or that they really belong in Canadian literature and this is an essay collection that deals with how Canadian literature can be torn down to essentially be rebuilt. So while I love the idea of trying to rebuild the Canadian literature scene into a place that is more welcoming and less toxic or hostile, some of the essays in here did seem very one 
one-sided and very critical and sometimes the solutions seemed very unrealistic so they kind of lost me with a few points in here I would have loved to have seen more of a variety of viewpoints represented I guess to get both sides of the issues but still if you're looking for juicy Canadian drama this book does deliver and then next up I have Trick Mirror by Gia Tolentino this is a recent collection of essays that have been pretty popular and this is one of those books that suffered from a bit too much hype like I think I went in with my expectations a little bit too high because the essays in here were fine but they just didn't really impress me all that much and I think part of my issue with this is the title here Trick Mirror reflections on self-delusion. Like I felt like this book was going to give me this weird funhouse perception of society that was going to really flip my point of view and I didn't really feel like that happened in here at all. I felt Tolentino was kind of reinforcing a lot of popular beliefs that as a younger reader I think you would already be pretty familiar with. Tolentino is a solid writer and she's engaging but I didn't feel much of a personal connection with her as an essay stylist and I didn't think that she was presenting anything that was super mind-blowing. So I guess these essays were okay but this collection has definitely been hyped up in my opinion. And last up, real quick before I go, I have a few works that relate to Shakespeare that I want to talk about. So one of the Shakespearean plays that I read for the first time this summer was The Taming of the Shrew. This is one of his comedies that I had felt really guilty that I hadn't read since it's pretty well known. I read this over two sittings, over two days, and acts one through three were delightful. They're so wonderful. I was having a grand old time. And then I picked it up again the next day and acts four and five happen and there's kind of a radical shift that goes on. Basically, if you know the premise, it's about a man who wants to tame his wife and make her more submissive and less shrewish. And he does so by some very questionable methods that you kind of feel bad reading the second half of it because he's basically torturing her. So from a modern perspective, that half wasn't as cool. And you can't help but feel that those scenes might have been played for laughs <laughs> for an Elizabethan audience. So the second half of this was very confusing. At the same time, I feel like it's so over the top with the misogyny that I also kind of hope that it's ironic in some ways and that there's some pointed commentary in here. So I had mixed feelings about this one, but it was really interesting to think about while I was reading it. And then after that, I mostly did a lot of rereading for some Shakespearean plays. One of the plays I reread was Much Ado About Nothing. This was the first Shakespeare play that I ever read when I was in eighth grade and it was such a wonderful introduction to Shakespeare. I'm so lucky that I had a teacher who made it a really positive experience because obviously you can see I've gone on to really appreciate him later on in life. So anyway, uh, this is just a really fun play. It's kind of scary, the message of it, because it's about all of this chaos and uproar that's created really out of nothing, out of some rumors. And the villain in this just kind of wants to create drama because he feels sad. Like he doesn't really have much of a motive to really uproot everyone's lives. So that's kind of what scared me reading this play again as an adult, but I did really enjoy it. Then I also ended up rereading Othello because I saw my first live production of this. This is maybe my third or fourth time rereading this play now. It's one that I've gone back to a lot over my life and I also just keep appreciating it more and more. This has to be one of my favorite of um, Shakespeare's tragedies. It's just so dark, it's so twisted, and I really feel for some of the characters in this. But it's also been cool to see how my feelings have changed over time because I have this old copy of the text that I've annotated the few times that I've studied it and I really like going back to my notes and seeing how my opinions and my reading skills have changed over the years so I've had a great time revisiting this one. After reading this I also checked out New Boy by Tracy Chevalier and this is in the Hogarth Shakespeare series where they make these modern novelized versions of Shakespeare's plays. This one I was pretty skeptical about because it is set on a playground at a school in Washington during the 1970s. So Othello playing out as a schoolyard drama didn't seem like the most compelling choice and I have to say it just didn't work for me. I feel like Othello is just such a grown-up play, you know? The passion in it, like it's just not really appropriate to transfer those kind of insecurities and deep emotions to these younger kids. Not saying that kids don't feel things deeply, they do, but in a different kind of way. So this one just 
didn't quite work for me. And it also made me appreciate why Shakespeare's play is so much more powerful because in a play, you don't really understand why the characters are doing what they're doing. We only really get their words. But in a novel, the narrator is kind of trying to filter their thoughts and explain and rationalize. And I found that took away a lot of the power of these characters. So did not love this one very much. And then I got to reread Hamlet uh, because I got to teach this play for the first time with my grade 12s, which was such a fulfilling experience. I truly love Hamlet and I really loved that I got the chance to really nerd out over this text. I bought myself an Arden Shakespeare edition so that I could really go line by line throughout this sucker <laughs> so that I could really do it justice while I was going through it with my students and I love Hamlet so much. I mean, the more that I read it, the more that it confuses me, but also sucks me into its twisted world. Like this play, you kind of get into this obsessive mindset. You know, when you're teaching Hamlet for that three or four weeks or whatever, like I was thinking about Hamlet all the time. And my boyfriend was just making fun of me because he would say something or he'd watch something on TV and I'd be like, oh man, that's just like Hamlet. Like, I was thinking about these connections all the time. I don't know, I guess this play just kind of burrowed its way deep into my mind and sort of took over my life for a while. But I don't know, it was an enjoyable parasite to experience. I loved it. I loved the experience of analyzing it and teaching this and discussing this. So Hamlet's just truly great. And it was such a wonderful opportunity to get to explore this in greater depth. And then finally, the last book I have to show you is a biography of Shakespeare himself. And this is by Anthony Burgess, who is probably more famous for writing A Clockwork Orange. This is a biography that plays very fast and loose with historical detail. Because we don't really know much about Shakespeare, there are a lot of gaps in his life, Burgess kind of takes some liberties by filling in some of those details with his imagination. So this is a very engaging biography. It's very rich in these sensory depictions of what London was like at the time and the people that Shakespeare knew and his world and some great analysis of some of his plays. So I really enjoyed it. However, Burgess is also kind of making up a bunch of this stuff. He's kind of using what he knows about Shakespeare and just filling in those details on his own. So if you're someone that needs your biography to be fully fact-checked and true, then this isn't going to be for you because he is making a lot of stuff up. But it does make for a really great read and there's some very fascinating speculation about the man and his plays. So I had a great time reading this and I think it did help me understand Shakespeare on a bit of a deeper level. So really loved checking this one out. Also, I highly recommend recommend this gorgeous folio society edition of this book. It really was a beautiful way to experience this text. Oh my goodness, we have made it to the end of my gigantic August, September, October wrap up. Thanks so much for checking back in on my channel and seeing how I'm doing. I am hoping to get things back together and start posting more consistently by the end of the year. I mean, it's year end best book list season. How could I miss out on that? So I am hoping to be checking in more often and I do have a November wrap up still to come too. So thanks so much for checking out this video. Let me know if you've read anything good in the past few months while I've been away and hopefully I'll see you again real soon. Take care. Bye.